Thank you for allowing me to speak to the organizing committee. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Now, I'm going to talk about the new findings of MacTel 2, and I'm going to hopefully walk around a bit with, because we have these lavalier mics, and I, I hope that they're loud enough. Is that, is that true? Yes. Oh, good. So, uh, MacTel 2, uh, the disease we call now, really was originally called by, uh, by Gas, the guy who originally described it in 1977, as bilateral juxtafovial telangiectasia group 2A. Now, that's pretty hard to say, and uh, maybe people aren't as able to say that as whatever. So, the name was shortened down to macular telangiectasia 2, or MACTEL 2, which is even easier to say, kind of snappy name. So the clinical characteristics of this disease are shown in this list, but early on there's a loss of transparency of the macula, crystalline deposits form, the blood vessels seem to get this gnarly look to them, right angle veins form, there's invasion of blood vessels deeper, atrophy can happen, and there's neovascularization. So here's a, just a black and white picture and a fluorescein of a case of MACTEL2, and you can see that there's these crystals in the retina, and these, there's sort of unusual looking blood vessels in the temporal juxtafovial macula. That's a typical place where they occur. And here's a little bit more advanced case. And you can see that the retina is starting to be, lose its transparency. It's harder to see through. It has a grayish look to it. But there's also some pigmentary migration up into the retina. And you can see there's a, a later staining of the ju temporal juxtafovial macula in the fluorescein angiogram. Here's another case, and if you look very carefully at this, you can see it looks like the let, there's layers of blood vessels in the retina. And we well, think that there's layers of blood vessels in the retina, but these are wrong size and maybe the wrong orientation for these blood vessels. Here's a color picture, and if you notice the color picture that we're losing transparency here, there's pigmentation here, but also notice even in the eye that's not that affected that the macula looks red, right? The original old-time middle-aged sort of anatomist called the macula the macula lutea, which means yellow spot, because the macula should be yellow. But you notice this is red, and I thought that was kind of unusual. So I, I wrote this book. This is one of the first book I wrote. And in that book, I said, the macula in MACTEL patients is red. That means maybe that it's either atrophic or they don't have macular pigment. Now, that was a kind of strange thing to say at the time, since there was no disease known that had loss of macular pigment. But in fact, more than 10 years later, it was shown that people with, uh, with MACTEL2 actually don't have macular pigment and occurs in a zone that's about three by four millimeters wide, and people call that the MACTEL zone. If we look at a close up at a patient with MACTEL, you can see that there's crystals in this patient. Again, see how red the fovea looks? And if we look at a fluorescein angiogram, it looks like this. And the problem with a fluorescein angiogram is hard to tell what's going on. So this was one of the first diseases people looked at with OCT angiography to try to figure out what's happening. Many people looked at it with B scans, but it's hard to piece together blood vessel courses just in a B scan. So I'm very interested in using volume rendering, which is something that we do, say, with MRI. When you look at a knee or something like that, you look at the whole knee, not just slices through the knee, or you look at a whole brain instead of looking at slices through the brain. And uh, so this is a early on kind of volume rendering I did. And what I did for these is colored the superficial plexus or the level of superficial plexus blue, the deep plexus red. And if there are any blood vessels below that, which there shouldn't be, I made those yellow. And I'll show that again. Again, this superficial plexus blue, deep plexus red, and deeper than that yellow. And notice that these yellow blood vessels have a gnarly look to them. They're kind of knobby look. Another way to look at this is just to fade the intensity of the inner and the super uh, deep layers to look just at those layer of yellow blood vessels here and just keep that in your memory banks. And if we go back to the fluorescein image, it's really the same thing. So those deeper blood vessels are really what stain late in fluorescein angiography. And we showed that for a group of patients. Here's a, another patient who has a right angle vein coming down here through this mass. And again, on a fluorescein, it's hard to tell what's going on. <clears throat> but with this newer method of looking at using volume rendering OCT angiography, you can see how this right angle vein comes down into this knot of blood vessels, and they're being pulled across the foveal avascular zone. And here's a closer up version. We can flip this around, and I still kept those deeper blood vessels as yellow. So here's the, the video. I rocked this back and forth. You can do this in any way you want in real life on a computer. It's just hard to do in a PowerPoint slide. But notice the clarity of these blood vessels. And you can see how this, this area here juts out towards you 
that's because those are actually deeper. They're going deeper into the retina. Here I color coded again with the blue at the level of the superficial plexus, red deeper, and the yellow is deeper than the deep plexus. That really shouldn't exist. In addition, I uh, segmented out the cavitations in the retina, and you can see this patient has a cavitation in the central macula. Notice how small the foveolae vascular zone is, and it's drawn over to the side into this area. We can look at this at higher magnification, and look at the blood vessels. They're pulled up in these really short, acute angles, kind of triangles getting pulled towards this center area here, and there seems to be an epicenter where the blood vessels are being pulled towards that and deeper, because notice that they go from blue to red or blue to red to yellow, and here's that cavitation. And people in real, they said, well, maybe that's just some weird way of your imaging that's making it look like that. So I went back to look at color photographs of people over time. And here's a 10-year interval of a patient. And notice I put these triangles right where there's branch points. And they stretched out towards this area here. So these blood vessels over a 10-year period were pulled over here. And that's actually a common thing to see if you have a longer-term follow-up of MACTEL patients. And I made a, this other thing called the vector field, which is like, you notice, remember those m weather maps where they have the arrow of, shows the direction of the wind and the length shows how strong the wind is? This is kind of the same idea, looking at the deformation of the, the central macula over time, where you can see the direction of where all this deformation occurred and the amount, and it's, there's a barcode here, uh, showing how, how the direction and the magnitude of the change. Well, we can flip this over and look at a MACTEL patient eye from the back, and we know that because we're looking at the chorea cap, I mean the deep plexus here, and here's those knot of deep blood vessels that are deeper. Here's that same patient, remember, with the cavitation, but notice there's lots of little cavitations. And so I call those micro-cavitations, being that seems a creative name, right? <laughs> but uh, if you actually go back, and these were actually always present on OCT, it's just I don't think anybody picked them out before, so we reported this, that these micro-cavitations happen at MACTEL. Now remember I told you about there's an area where there's lack of pigmentation in MACTEL. It's a three by four millimeter area that we call a MACTEL zone. Most of these micro-cavitations happen in that area. There's a couple that happen outside of it, but by and large, the majority of them only happen in that MACTEL zone. So there's a kind of a war zone in MACTEL in which there's a loss of pigmentation and all these other changes occurring at the same time. Lois Smith at Harvard made an animal model of MACTEL, which she used the VRDL receptor knockout mouse. And they developed telangiectasis, but they developed choreal retinolastomosis. So obviously, it's not such a great model, right? And she did confocal microscopy and showed these blood vessels descending down. And she did volume rendering of the confocal microscopy and to show these blood vessels going down from the retina to the choroid in three dimensions. But actually, if you look at MACTEL2 patients, and here's a, a section going across here, here's 10 micron sections that are go deeper down through the retina. And you can look at this blood flow as it goes down, and it sure looks like there's a retinochoroidal anastomosis there. That's hard to tell in a B scan because you're only looking at 10 microns thick out of thousands of microns of retina, right? But volume rendering can solve that thing because we look basically at everything at once. So that's what I did. And so this is volume rendering, and this is the projection artifacts were removed from that. And you can see these blood vessels going down into the, from the retina down into what this is the chorea capillaris. And you can rotate that image, and again, you can see this stuff in real life if you either do it on a computer, or as I'll show you later, there's kind of a cool way to do, look at this. And I made the RP still kind of a remnant of that still layers. So it's kind of gray, so you can see the level of the RP. Here's a patient with a right angle vein. If you look closely at the, floor, oops, at the fluorescein filling, you can see that this segment fills a little different tempo than the rest, and there's even laminar flow coming up from here. But if you come down here, you can notice there's a little like branch point there. And here's this, this same vessel coming down on this o volume rendered OCT, showing how this blood vessel comes down and meets up with the chorea capillaris. We probably had a clue that this existed all along. And I'm just going to show you this image. And if you see how narrow this little arterial is, and look how tiny that arterial is. They're so fine, you can barely see them, right? You can almost see no blood vessels here, but then all of a sudden this big fat vein comes out of nowhere. Where did the blood flow from that vein come from? It's probably from the choroid. So uh, retinal choroid on that's most very common. It's a new finding in MACTEL2. And you can see how these blood vessels come up. It's quite easy to see. And this happens 
pretty early in the disease. It's not a late phase sort of thing in the disease. So Peter Maloka is a friend of mine, and I made these porting. We ported over OCT angiography into VR goggles. And this is a sure fire way to make somebody look ridiculous, is to show them when they're doing VR stuff. But you can see this is a, a MACTEL patient, and you can see how these blood vessels come down. Now, if you actually wore the VR goggles, it would be something about as big as this room, and you can move it around. It's, pr it's pretty fun. This is a slicing tool that we have, and you can see how if you slice into this thing, you can slice into blood vessels that are coming down from the retina into the chorate. And here's another group we're coming up to here. And you can see that, them going down into the, into the choroid. I'm gonna finish off with just a quick blast about some new genetic studies about MACTEL2. And there's not one gene that's really associated with MACTEL2, but there's a group of genes in the one carbon pathway that do seem to be associated uh, with MACTEL2. The one carbon pathway is something you learned in medical school and probably forgot about. I, sh I certainly did a long time ago. But the, the upshot of this is that one carbon pathway is used to help generate energy. And it's used to generate antioxidants as well. So uh, photoreceptors use all the oxygen that's available to them. And even if you gave them more oxygen and had oxygen around, they would still use glycolysis. So photoreceptors really like glycolysis. And the one carbon pathway helps in that to generate even additional energy to, in, in terms of glycolysis, as well as generating any TPH. The curious thing is that serine and protein and proline are used in the one carbon pathway. And if those are the genes that are involved that have been so far found in MACTEL2 patients, there was a series of patients were, were had with MACTEL2, and they had serine and protein proline levels measured, and they were decreased compared to controls. So there may be something in the one carbon pathway, and it would make you think, man, maybe you can supplement these people with serine or proline, and then maybe there's a reason not to, as I'll come up to next. Aerobic glycolysis is called the Warburg effect, and that was first discovered about 100 years ago, where Warburg noticed that if you cultured retinal cells, no matter how much oxygen you give them, they would still use glycolysis. And there was one other kind of cell type that does that. Does anybody know? The other kind of cell that does the same thing are tumor cells. And they depend a lot on NADPH production through the one carbon pathway. And they, tumor cells require a lot of serine or proline to help this, keep this going. And the curious thing is if you give tissue serine or proline, it actually promotes tumor growth. And antifolates like methotrexate block that. So you, you're pretty familiar with that. So that's worrisome in MACTEL. It's hard to design a proper trial or get informed consent if you're giving a supplement that may actually encourage tumor formation. So I talked about the original ideas of uh, MACTEL that were really established in 1977 by gas. This remained relatively constant up until maybe 2014 when there was more widespread use of OCT angiography. And there's been a really rapid change over the last two years when we'll be able to incorporate uh, improved OCT angiography. So, this is really an example of how OCT angiography has helped us understand macular disease. Thank you. <laughs>